they, through their money, which is massive, actually determine the curriculum in a medical school. It's weakened immune systems, their profit margin. How does Big Pharma get its money? By the population being sick. It's advertised every 10 minutes on television, there's a new drug or a drug, and it's put into their heads like, your life's not working right? <gasps> this drug, look at the happy people. See, they've taken the drug and how happy they are. Pharmaceutical drugs kill about 300,000 people a year. Look at the pharmaceutical cartel, Big Pharma. The third biggest cause of death in the United States is the frickin' treatment. Look at all the crap in food that is legally allowed, never should be, and all these other things. Um, look at the pharmaceutical cartel, Big Pharma. The third biggest cause of death in the United States is the frickin' treatment after heart disease and cancer. How does Big Pharma get its money by the population being sick? And I'll tell you what, Brian, I will take this system seriously. I will, I will think, oh, well, maybe they do care a little bit. When they come out, mainstream everything, mainstream medicine, and say, here is how you boost and strengthen your immune system. Vitamin A, vitamin D3, vitamin C, something to boost the thyroid function, which produces vitamin A. Let's get the immune system going. What are they saying instead? Oh, weaken immune systems that why people are dying. Okay, so what are you telling them about how to boost their immune system? Well, they're not. Because first of all, even on a purely financial level, in terms of big pharma, what would a strong immune system in the population in general do? Their profits would absolutely frickin' plummet. Because it's weakened immune systems, their profit margin. Some doctors who actually have sussed it are pointing out, you know, that it's not, it's not the virus that's killing people. It's their immune system that's killing them. Every time a scientist has come up with a new idea, that scientist was always claimed as being weird or crazy or, you know, way off track. My research was repeatable every day, and you could predict it. The point about that is in science, prediction means you understand something. If you can predict it before you do it, then you have some insight. My predictions were always accurate. It just didn't fit the conventional storyline. And it took about 20 years before science owned what I was talking about and gave it the name epigenetics. That's the new science. I'll tell you where the problem comes from. Not so much the scientists, but the pharmaceutical industry. And the reason why this becomes important is because the pharmaceutical industry runs the show in medicine. If you could put this kind of healing that I'm talking about into a capsule or tablet, they'd be talking about it right now. If you understand epigenetics, you don't need the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. And all of a sudden it's like, well, that's not in the interest of the, you know, one of the biggest industries on this planet to say, you can heal yourself without drugs? And I go, absolutely. How do they do it is money. Money is big. Money, uh, if I give grants, you can study what I'm going to give you a grant for. So they direct a lot of research with their billions and billions of dollars. And it was actually interesting, the British Journal of Medicine had a review of looking at the same research and determining if the research was funded by government money or the research was funded by private money, like pharmaceutical agency. The results came out four to five times more in the favor of the private industry when they paid for it as compared to when it was just government money uh, without any special interest behind it. So right away there's a manipulation of the data. You go, well, you mean these guys are cheating? I go, well, they're selecting the data to fit. Why? Because if I'm getting a grant and I write back, I say, oh, sorry, pharmaceutical, I checked all your stuff and it doesn't work. Uh, I'm not going to get another grant from so them. So are the doctors lying? Well, they're not lying, but they pick data that okay. supports their point. So they already have a conclusion before they even did the experiment. Okay, even in a double-blind study. Yeah, that's a. There's no such thing as a double-blind study. Okay, because yeah. people bring their own preconceptions to any study. Absolutely. And maybe even the pharmaceuticals are choosing which things to fund because they know they'll get the results. Absolutely, and one of the things they're trying to get rid of are people who respond to the placebo effect because the placebo effect throws the data right off the chart. A simple fact is this, and people might be upset, but drugs like Prozac uh, in laboratory tests are no better than a sugar pill. And that's how many billions of dollars a day on this planet are spent buying Prozac yes. or statin drugs. Statin drugs help less than 
of the people that take them. And in fact, they cause uh, side effects that are dangerous in about 23%. So you help 3% with a drug, 23% are getting toxic from the drug. And the idea is these are drugs that, uh, how long do you take statins? How long do you plan to live? Pharmaceutical drugs kill about 300,000 people a year. And everybody's, oh, oh, that's just the cost of doing medicine. And yet they have a war on drugs, which kill less than 30,000 people a year. And all of a sudden you got a war because 30,000 people died, 300,000 people died. That's, that's business as usual. My research in stem cells, which was over 40 years ago, I was cloning stem cells, revealed that I could put genetically identical cells in different Petri dishes, but if I change the environment, the cells have different fates. So my research revealed the genes didn't control the fate, it was a response to the environment. Well, then I come back just to understand who we are. We look as single individual humans, but we're actually comprised of 50 trillion cells. So essentially, we're skin-covered Petri dishes, and the blood in our body is the culture medium. When I change the culture medium in my experiments, I change the fate of the cells. Well, it turns out the blood in our body controls the fate of the cells in our body, but the composition of the blood is controlled by the brain and the mind. So when we perceive love, for example, uh, we release a lot of oxytocin, which stimulate growth, maintenance, and harmony. But in contrast, if I have a fear or a stress, I release cortisol and norepinephrine yes. and histamine. Yeah. Well, this causes a protection response and shuts down the body and changes the behavior of the cells. How? My mind causes the brain to release the special chemicals which go mm -hmm. into the blood, and the blood's a culture medium and controls the fate. So basically, as you have different thoughts, you release different chemistry, right. and therefore you have finite control. Through the mind, this is a number that's staggering, you can modify every gene in your body to create 30,000 variations from the same gene blueprint. What we can do every day is to start to recognize that what we perceive in the environment, and what we think we see in the environment, is actually what controls the genetic activity. I started becoming fascinated with the idea that you can give someone a sugar pill, a saline injection, or perform some false surgery or treatment, and a certain percentage of those people will accept, believe, and surrender to the thought that they're getting the actual substance or treatment. And they begin to program their autonomic nervous system to make the exact pharmacy of chemicals equal to the substance that they think they're taking. So then it begs the question, is it the inert placebo that's doing the healing or is it the body's innate capacity to heal by thought alone? Because that pill is a symbol of possibility. All it is is a symbol. For the doctor says, this is a great new drug that's gonna help with depression, and the person begins to think about the idea that they could get better. They're selecting a new potential in the quantum field. And then all of a sudden, a certain percentage of those people will get enthusiastic, and theos, filled with God, inspired, optimistic. They start changing their emotional state. They're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion, and they're changing their state of being. And all of a sudden now, I began to realize, do you need the sugar pill? Do you need the saline injection? Or can you teach a person, instead of putting their faith and belief in something exogenous outside of them that would do the healing to change their state of being, can they just select the new potential in the quantum field instead of focusing on an unknown, focus on an unknown and revisit that unknown every single day until it becomes a known? And all of a sudden, you'll see people's depression go away, their anxiety go away, and they're not using the placebo any longer. They're healing by changing their internal states. And so that's, we started seeing those changes taking place before I wrote the placebos. And placebos, just so you know, work any range from working anywhere from 10% to 100%. Imagine that. So in a depression study, as an example, 83% or 81% of the people in a depression study that are given a placebo heal as well as the people that are given the actual antidepressants. Now, there's brain scans to show changes in their brain before and after. It means then they're making their own pharmacy of antidepressants by thought alone. And it took them six weeks, eight weeks of taking that placebo every single day. Now, this is an important point because most people think, oh, I did, I did the 
exercise or the meditation once and my conditions should go away. Well, even in the depression study, six to eight weeks of taking a placebo, every time they take the placebo, they remind themselves that they're gonna get better, they change their emotional state, sooner or later that becomes their new state of being. It may take people six to eight weeks of doing the work every single day where they start noticing significant changes in their health. So, I'm a pragmatist. And if you're telling me something that's science-based, the question that I ask is, how am I going to apply this to my life? So, as people begin to gather this information, I now know that every time we learn something new, we're making new connections in our brain. That's what learning is. If people can understand the understanding of the new sciences, quantum physics, neuroscience, neuroendocrinology, psychoneuroimmunology, the mind-body connection, epigenetics, all of those sciences point the finger at possibility. And if I can instruct them in a way that they begin to piece together the model, when I feel like they are at a certain point where the comprehension is right, if they can turn to the person next to them and explain it in the workshop, if they can't explain it, it's not wired in their brain. But if they can explain it, they're beginning to install the neurological hardware in their brain in preparation for an experience. So then if I can set up the conditions in the environment and give them the proper instruction and, and allow them to surrender enough into the present moment, a certain percentage of those people are going to get their behaviors to match their intentions. And when they do, they're going to experience something new. And the experience then is going to produce an emotion and they're going to feel unlimited and they're going to feel whole, they're going to feel invincible. The moment they feel that emotion, now they're teaching their body chemically to understand what their mind is intellectually understood. Now they're embodying the truth of that philosophy by initiating it, which means if you've done it once, you'll be able to do it again. If you can repeat the experience over and over again, you'll begin to neurochemically condition your mind and body to begin to work as one. When you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it as well as your mind, now you're mastering that philosophy and now you're in a new state of being. So we have to go from, from philosopher to initiate to master, from thinking to doing to being.